Here we are, students, teachers, and the generally curious coming down to our final four episodes of the Constitution in American Life with us, the Friends of Publius. You know, fellow fops, I came across some interesting data this week that motivated me to read parts of The Age of Reason by Thomas Paine. I believe that we would all agree that this is a seminal work of the 18th century and provides insights, specific insights, into the minds of Americans. I do wonder if the age of reason ever actually existed, however, and I, and I, I wonder whether we are living in the age of the death of reason. What inspires me to think this is some recent data I came across. First, 60% of Americans, Americans, believe that we are on the wrong track in regards to the economic and financial health of the nation. But 62% of those who, who stated that, uh, they also said that they would rate their personal economic status as very positive there. So they're doing well, but the nation sucks. 62% uh, in a poll said that they would rate or excuse me, 70% of the American people believe that our public school system is failing and is in significant decline. But 60% of those who stated that said that they were very happy with their child's school and child's education in the public school system. Lastly, and probably the most depressing, is that 55% of Republicans said they would still vote for Donald Trump for president, even if he were convicted of a felony. So, Fops, uh, what insights, if any, can you provide to this commentary on the American people? Is the age of reason dead? Was there ever an age of reason? What do you think? Uh, Neil Postman. Neil Postman uh, wrote a book about 25 years ago called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Uh, and he, he, he pointed out some uh, illogical irrational things about our culture but i also think uh the the book that i think uh now now hold on guys it's called it was called the closing of the american mind yeah. uh also about 25 years ago uh a pretty heady analysis it's not for the faint of heart uh but i think he 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 does a pretty good analysis of how um we've left the modern world if indeed it ever existed to your point david but have fully embraced a postmodern, irrational, uh, irrational world. So, but but he was talking about the postmodernism of the left. What's interesting is looking looking back at that on that book, the problems that it's Bloom, right? The the yep. problems yep. that he identifies to me is now more indicative of of a postmodernism on the right. Uh, uh, there. <laughs> well, I think. I think to obliterate universal uh, truths and values and, and uh, you know, standards like that, that that's not uh, that's not just on a problem with the left. And uh, so I think postmodern is postmodernism. Um, well, you would agree that he was predominantly identifying the the academic oh, absolutely. intellectual left at the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Mike or Chris, any thoughts about the age of reason and these what can seem inconsistent, you know? Uh, schools suck, except my kid's school is doing great. Yeah, I think we've always, um, uh, people have always kind of judged things with their heads and their hearts. So I don't, I don't know if there was an age of pure reason as much as we like to romanticize that. Oh, I just brought up romanticize, age of reason, enlightenment. I'm mixing up all my time periods <laughs> there. <laughs> um, I do think though, I don't know. I think we we took for granted the um, the kind of the Cold War consensus um, that emerged there after World War II, and I think you can you can look at from Clinton and Newt Gingrich up till today, and there's a through line there of of this increasing sort of what you might call your rationality or this uh, this politics of polarization that I think is for me the bigger frame is. 
we have nothing to fear now, maybe except ourselves. And, and we're going to do a, a, a good job of trying to beat each other up as much as we can. I don't know. Um, I'm going to uh, cite those wonderful philosophers from uh, your neck of the woods, uh, uh, Mike and, and David, the uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, and uh, their song, Throw Away Your Television. I think that might be a benefit. I'm also uh, listening to a fantastic book now by Heather Cox Richardson. It's called Democracy Awakening. Um, and it is a fantastic, um, I, they say read, but I'm listening to it as I'm, you know, trying to pretend like I'm exercising. Um, but it's uh, really uh, a, a, a wonderful narrative of kind of addresses that very thing, David, about how we got to this point which leads me back to the chili peppers and throw away your television. Well, thank you gentlemen for helping to provide me some clarity on the age of reason. So in today's session, we are going to be looking back to the constitutional government of the mother country to ascertain just how influential were the values, principles, and concepts of the British on the minds of Americans. And to what extent, if any, did we deviate and or reject those principles. So let's start with our resident. Hold, hold on, hold on. When you say when you say mother country, whose mother country are you referring to? My mother country. That would be England. Okay. Yes. Because right. Chris and I, we got a little Irish thing going there, right? Okay, Greater Britain, <laughs> Portugal. Uh, just you know, freedom. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, David. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. So, <laughs> Professor Moore. Yeah. How did the common law tradition develop in England? I mean, oh. this is I know, I but got to start somewhere. Good night, everybody. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, peace, love, yogurt, tacos. I mean, I guess, I guess, in some ways, it's a no duh question. You know, it's a common law tradition. It just evolved that uh, you know what parliamentary. Once there's a parliament. Well, I man, I'm assuming the common law tradition does not predate the existence of parliament. Oh, yeah, it does. It does. Oh, sure. Help me out with that. Um, well, I remember years ago, the first time I ever met my, my current boss that I've worked for for 13 years, he glibly said, you know, the British, uh, they, you know, when they get asked questions like, uh, you know, how long has that been around? And, and they, 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 they glibly use the phrase since time immemorial. Ah, uh, that's, that's great. That's a great line. But uh I think it, the point I think is that even the Brits, when they talk about, you know, the evolution of common law, the evolution of common law tradition, there's it's uh, it is a classic example of historians nitpicking over all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know, where's ground zero quite often comes up in those discussions. Um, so you're going to I'm going to do my best to try um, and answer that. Number one. It seems to me the Norman conquest is important because they come over, they conquer, and then they spend most of their time back in Normandy, which essentially means they're leaving locals to kind of administrate uh, all of this, this law. Uh, so, and I think what eventually would become these shires, you have a lot of this uh, localized administration of, of policy after the Norman conquest. Uh, so I think there, you know, and that's and that's in, uh, I think, 1166, I think, is when the Norman conquest is. But I think a, a really important uh, possible ground zero um, from everything I've read seems to point to Henry II. Where uh, there's a couple things that occur under his uh, under his uh, auspices. And one of them is is called the uh, size of Clarendon. You start to see these uh, localized common law, um, really basic level rules that develop, and and it's a uh, it's done under the auspices of this statement of these as eyes of Clarendon, and that's dated. Uh, oh shoot, it's somewhere on my on my notes. Um, so so you start to see these these uh, kind of what we would consider minor, almost like small claims court type stuff in our parlance today. You also start to see uh, people starting to systematize a lot of these things that are going on in the 1100s and 1200s. And this guy named Lord Bracton, 
he writes this massive tome that starts to um, organize all of these local decisions and all of these localized policies that are developing around uh, around Britain at the time. So Bracton's book, and then eventually they would be called, I think they were called like yearbooks that kind of updated every year these uh, these decisions that had been made around around the country in these various locales and shires. Uh, so it's almost like, uh, you know, I, I, the Supreme Court always has these updates every year of what went on. So Lord Bracton seems to have a role in developing that. But then there's also uh, the, the 1200s and, and most notably Magna Carta. Um, and so uh, and there's some notion that there are these these councils that may be proto parliament um, or, and these courts that are almost proto-parliament. So to your question, does it predate uh, parliament? Yeah, it kind of depends on which set of historians you're looking at uh, as to whether they 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 would uh, agree to that or not. But uh, you've got Magna Carta, which, which uh, uh, sets up some basic rules about uh, largely in reference to the king. Um, uh, but there's also some stuff in there for commoners. It It, it is still to, um, tilted towards addressing um, the upper classes. Uh, also, in uh, in 1237, there there starts to be these more formalized two different councils, and some would say that's the beginnings of Parliament uh, in 1237. Um, in the 1600s, um, you have some really remarkable constitutional things that occur. Um, you know, you have uh, I think students should look into Ed Edmund Cook's attempts to kind of systematize and organize the common law traditions. And there's a couple of really important cases that he's responsible for that kind of uh, further ref uh, winnow and, and refine the common law. Um, the Five Nights case and uh, Bonham, the Bonham case. I know Chris uh, has talked about that before. But then you also have um, the abolition of the Star Chamber, uh, which is is a significant event uh, because for several reasons, uh, one being it kind of starts to uh, remove ecclesiastical courts from uh, their sole hold on power in terms of heresy. But it also has a lot of uh, secular uh, due process implications. The Habeas Corpus Act um, and then ultimately the English Bill of Rights uh, comes out of the uh, the struggles for power. So there's a lot of history that drives the common law evolution, uh, but uh, and it's um, it's very complicated in the sense <laughs> that the first complication is when does it start, and second of all, what are the benchmarks uh, along that path that you can identify? Oh, a clearly important common law moment. Uh, well, there's hundreds and hundreds of them <laughs> in the story of the evolution of British common law. So, to what extent does it does does this tradition in English distinguish itself from the the countries of the continent, the European other European countries? Yeah, well, I mean, France has, uh, and I, I I'm not going to presume to know how to pronounce their uh, these laws and acts, uh, but France has somewhat of a common law tradition. Uh, the uh, the Germanic countries also do, uh, okay. but for for some reason the English system uh, is much more prevalent, uh, and I think it may have to do with the fact that the Normans conquer and then largely leave uh, the locals to administrate uh, you know government policy. I I think I th I really tend to think eleven sixty six may be uh, ground zero on that, and the distinction between um british isles and the continent so well and i think go ahead well i just want to dovetail it with what tim said i think there's I mean we always think of magna carta 1215 but there's 1217 1227 and i mean there's a it's just like you know and by the way when you said your book i had this uh, this idea this hey would you sign my yearbook would you sign <laughs> my yearbook um <laughs> but, but I think, it, and you mentioned um, Cook, uh, Sir Edward Cook, and, and students is spelled C O K E, but it's pronounced Cook uh, in the in the 17th century, and it's more so I think as you get into the idea of James the First and Charles the First and this this urinating contest that's happening between this Parliament that has been established over time 
wresting power from the king, you know, and they're trying to can, trying to live on that divine right of kings and his, and his, and his cook. They're, I don't want to say misinterprets Magna Carta, but he uh, it, uh, he certainly is using it as a jurist to really um, talk about this idea of this ancient constitution. You know, we're calling it an ancient constitution and establishing power for parliament to wrest that power away from this divine right of king. So I don't know if he's he's playing games or he sincerely believes it, but I mean, it's more how he interprets Magna Carta than what actually happened. Yeah. I think Mike has mentioned before, uh, you know, cultural narratives and uh, Americans are prone to really pay a lot of attention to our founding. And we create a whole set of uh, stories and narratives about our founding. And I think, I mean, to your point, Chris, I think Cook is uh, is is doing a little bit because a lot of a lot of British historians would say the same thing that Cook's a little creative with with the uh, the mythology of the of the uh, Magna Carta. By the way, your your description, Tim, sounds a lot like salutary neglect. The Normans you know, coming over. Uh, you know, well, I mean, or federalism. Right, right, right. Oh, another interesting thing I forgot to mention is uh, there's this other interesting thing that happens in the 1600s that Parliament passes this thing called the Triennial Act. It basically says we're going to meet regardless of whether the, the 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 crown calls us into session, because that was always a, a bone of contention between Parliament and the crown. So the Triennial Act is a great common law tradition of like we're taking charge of our own calendar. Uh, and we don't have to ask you for permission to meet. So I think there's so much. I mean, really, the 1600s is a remarkable uh, hundred year period in terms of British evolution. I right? want to. Yeah, I want to add to this. And I, I feel kind of bad about doing this, but it's my only chance to correct. Not that bad that you're just going to stop you from doing it. Like, you know, <laughs> it got drilled into my head when I was studying abroad in England that the last time they were successfully invaded was 1066. <laughs> and, what's, and what's interesting is that we're talking about history so long ago. It's like 1066, 1166. What's the big deal? But it's like half of our, it's almost half of our time as a, you know, since the constitution. <laughs> but Tim is really onto something. There's a book I used to use in my political science courses. I think it was called Birth of the Leviathan, where it was this historical account of different political institutions and he goes back to this period of the 1100s. He goes back to the importance of decentralization and what is what seeds can be planted. So even later in history, when you have very centralized governments come in there, those seeds of what it was like to be autonomous and um, independent are still there. And one of my favorite books in political science by Robert Putnam called Making Democracy Work, he He's looking how Northern Italy is more civic than Southern Italy. And he has this whole chapter on history. And he says, it's all because of the 1100s. And historians just took him the task, right? Like, you don't know what you're doing. And he has this line in his book I just love as a political scientist. He says, um, to get to Tim's question, like students of, maybe we don't need to know the actual time of when parliament started in common law. He says, uh, linear causal questions must not crowd out equilibrium analysis. In this context, <laughs> The culture versus structure chicken and egg debate is ultimately fruitless. More important is to understand how history smooths some paths and closes off others. That's the political scientists doing history. And I just love it. <laughs> anyway. well, and, and talking about time, uh, students and teachers, that's all we have on this question uh, there. Uh, so uh, it's been a wonderful night. <laughs> I'm sorry, you asked me a thousand year question? Please, uh, so, somebody, I don't know how, uh, you know, uh, poison my coffee or whatever next time I want to talk about the genesis of common law uh, in England there kind of stuff. So let's try a new one. And let's, let's go with another concept here. And if we can focus on the 17th and 18th century, Professor Kavanaugh, can you explain what is meant by the concept rights of Englishmen? Uh, that is, what is meant and who the concept applies to? Well, I, I, I think um, I'm going to go back to he's got to go back to, to Cook because he will he'll make some arguments as a jurist. I mean, you think about uh, the Five Nights case that Tim mentioned or Dr. Baum's case, you know, when you're getting into the, the ability of the king's men to go into places. And, um, you know, the no matter. Uh, gosh, I, I wish I remembered this language he used about, uh, you know, about the, the castle doctrine. 
you know, is, is Cook that creates a castle doctrine that, that a man's shack, no matter how the wind may whistle through it, or, and he describes, you know, just a pretty rundown little piece of, you know, property. But it's a place the king doesn't belong because of the rights of Englishmen. There's a certain place the king does not belong, which you can kind of hear that um, in some more modern court cases. There are certain places that the government does not belong, say, in the marital bedroom. Fast forward to Griswold versus Connecticut. So I think if you if you go back to his cook and taking his interpretation, creative as it may be, of Magna Carta and relying it in there that there are certain rights of Englishmen that we have. And of course, fast forward to Blackstone or Blackstone and his, you know, his his writings, because then he's gonna he's gonna put this out in, in his commentaries. Um a little bit later, well, about a, what seventeen fifties or somewhere in there. When's Blackston? I'm, I'm off the top of my head. Uh, well, he wrote uh, sixty-seven. I think it was Six, sixty-seven. Yeah. Okay, uh, so you fast forward to Blackston, and and um, you know, so I think it's you. These jurists then are holding on to this language in a way to actually to limit the power of the king. I mean, and uh, you see that, you know, working its way to this side of the Atlantic, when we start, you start reading what some of the colonists are writing about their rights as Englishmen being violated. Holy cow, go to um, James Otis and the uh, the um, writs of assistance cases in Boston in 1763. He's talking about the rights of Englishmen. Well, so, clearly the rights of Englishmen in the 17th and 18th century don't include women in nope. Great Britain, do they include every adult male in Great Britain? It depends. Uh, no, and it depends. No, I, I was going to, I was going to say, if you go back originally, I'll let Tim clean this up. If you think about, it, obviously, uh, I mean, the, there was a council of barons that were created after Magna Carta was given to King John and running me in 1215. And this council of barons, I think 25 or 25, don't quote me on that. But they're created this council of barons. They're going to have some laws, and of course, students will know that the the provisions or the concessions given by the king in the Magna Carta only applied to the barons. But it does plant that seed, right? That seed that will grow by the time it gets to Cook, and certainly by the time it gets to Blackstone. It's much like you know the seed planted with the Declaration of Independence about all people being all, all men created equal. So it plants a seed because we know that we, the people in 1787, well, 1788 with the ratification, that we, the people was a very small group. But I would Tim say, yeah, I would say to, to piggyback on that, if you ask a, a Brit where rights come from, they would say, well, the rights of Englishmen come through, you know, they can point to these moments in history where they they cornered a king or they forced parliament. They're rights that were extracted through some kind of power struggle. And the result of the power struggle is a right of Englishmen. So they're not universal. They're not God-given. They point to history. They point to moments where they got something from the crown. They got something from parliament. So the origin the origin issue, I think, is important to make a distinction of okay, how you identify rights of England. The other point, I think, is uh, relevant is very early after the 1100s, there are these different courts that evolved. There was uh, there's a, the forest courts, the church courts, the manor courts. They had all these courts for different things and for different kinds of people. So the rights of Englishmen. Uh, if you were a person that lived in and around the forests of the monarchy, uh, you know, you had certain rights of Englishmen in a forest court. Your rights of an Englishman might be varied if you were if you were uh, in, in a church court. Your rights of an Englishman might be a little bit different if you were in a manor court, which was very feudal, uh, a very feudal relationship in those courts. And that precedes that precedes Magna Carta. So the rights of Englishmen are textured depending on which court you're in. It, it, but all of them are rights that were extracted through some kind of struggle uh, from an authority. Okay. Uh, and that's very different than the American configuration of rights, which are, uh, you know, we, we call them natural rights. Um, that's well, not, that's very different. 
you know, our our narrative somewhat begins, however, with I guess some confusion about that because we, i.e., those in the North American colonies, assume that we possess these rights of Englishmen. And am I correct there, Professor Moore, that yes. the, the Parliament and the monarchy don't agree with that? No, we don't possess those. Well, then there's this other issue, too. Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, well, well, there's, let, I'll, I'll bypass that. There's also this issue of, um, are you a member of the realm or are you a member of a, are you a dominion person? So, you know, by the time we get to the 60s and then you get the De Declaratory Act, which basically defines Americans not as, or excuse me, British colonials as British, they're de being defined as a defeated subjects. That means they're dominion. You have, you're totally at the mercy and that's what the Declaratory Act was doing. It's saying you don't have these rights of Englishmen because you're Dominion people. Okay. I mean, so, so there's a a status in this. Now, if you're a, if you're an Englishman, you have these rights, and that's why I think the Americans make the switch. We're we're running this rights of Englishmen argument isn't getting us anywhere, and then they're also adding on that we're we're Dominion people. So I think there's a switch that takes place, and that's I think Otis's. I mean, he goes insane, literally. Uh, and I think he struggled with this notion of uh, the Blackstonian view of all rights are, are are emanated from some struggle in history versus to this universality, uh, the Enlightenment principles of natural rights. So I think there's several things in play there as to why the, the rights of Englishmen kind of runs out of gas in the American rhetoric. I mean, that's that's Dickinson's Pennsylvania farmer letters. He's arguing, you know, rights of Englishmen, and it just gets goes nowhere after 66. So, Professor Williams, to me, another fundamental, you know, conversation of the latter part of the 18th century or, you know, up until, you know, the revolution and, and stuff is is the notion of the rule of law. And so I am wondering, does our system of written constitutionalism lead to a different understanding of the rule of law? a different application of the rule of law than the British common law. I think that it could, and I, but I don't think it always does. So <laughs> I'm um, loving the precision of this discussion we're having tonight. <laughs> I nailed did, you that, did you get that from Putnam too? <laughs> I nailed the 1066 thing. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's not just you. It's not just you. We get, we get a lot of maybes. Uh, it depends. Here, uh, it depends. It depends. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I think students should, you, you probably already understand that in a in a place like United Kingdom where there is no written constitution, there's just written acts that parliament has written and put it together. Um, parliament is sovereign rather than a constitution. So in theory, yeah, having written constitutions at the state and federal level should accomplish some things that might make a more uh, universal, consistent application of the rule of law possible. So, for example, uh, if you've written your constitution uh, the way you should, it should be clear what rights are there to be protected, right? Which is you wouldn't have in a parliamentary system those rights could change based on acts of parliament. Um, you could set up systems of, of, of government where you could have some balance of power. And I think that having a balance of power is one of the factors we need to consider in thinking about whether a place has rule of law. Um, and then I think the power of judicial review, which isn't found in parliamentary systems because it is the parliament that is sovereign, the parliament can decide <clears throat> what the rule of law is. So I think in all those cases, like I think on paper and theory, it makes it so if you have a written constitution, you should have a more consistent, right? But, you know, we've we've talked about numerous times on this program about all the times, even with all those things going for us, where we just get it wrong. Like, I mean, we could start with, we will start, Korematsu, right? We could just go down the list of examples of, of court cases. And then I started, I want to, this is a little bit presentism, so I, I won't go too long on this, but um, y'all suggested a couple of weeks ago the, the PBS special, The Troubles. So I've, I I watched it this weekend. Um, students, this is a PBS documentary on the, the conflict in Northern Ireland. And so I did a little research just in terms of um, thinking through 
when there's domestic insurrection like that, um, what parliament could and could not do during the troubles and would that have been possible in the United States? And again, I think the answer is kind of, it depends. It shouldn't be as easy, right? There, there should be, when you're a socialist in the, in the 1920s, you should be able to stand up and say, you can't do this to me. There's a written law that says you can't do this, but we know that, that it was done. Um, but I think that the extent of that kind of, um, ignoring people's rights can go further if you don't have a written constitution in theory. So Professor Moore, uh, I'm going to take from my uh, Marxist historians that I had back in college, and it seems to me that the concept of justice, all right, oh. was oh. focused on the property interests, whether it be in England or in the colonies, accurate or not. When we look at this idea of justice, it's it's really all about economics and class. I'll try to be generous. Um, <laughs> Please. I think, well, in the British context, uh, no, because I I want to circle back to something I said earlier. There were these, there was these myriad of different kinds of courts that evolved within that early uh, constitutionalism in, in, in England or in Britain. Uh, so, and, and some of them definitely for, were for the rich people. Uh, but some of those courts dealt with very mundane, very local, very small, small issues that were not, you know, these were these were not populated with cases from from wealthy people. Now, they often involved, you know, money issues. But uh, I mean, uh, I think I use the phrase they're kind of like small claims courts. Um, so I think uh, I think. Um, I think ultimately you're asking me a philosophical question. What do I think about Marxism? No. And I, I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a big fan, largely because, well, of any narrative that that um, shoehorns all of history uh, into into a single a single explanation. And I think uh, I think the Marxist critique, um, the Marxist framework, does explain some things in history. I think it, uh, and it's worth it's worth thinking about. But I think it's a little ham-handed in saying it all. You know, justice equals all um, money issues. So in the English context, I, I don't think so. Um, and uh, I think depending where you plop yourself down in American history, I think there's a point to be made that there's an economic uh, overlay to a lot of these justice issues. Um, but then other times, I'm I'm not quite sure because people. Um, you know, I think we're well acquainted with the the theory that sometimes people go against their financial interests in the way they proceed with their lives and, and policy preferences. So I think it's a little ham handed for my <laughs> taste. All right, uh, go, go ahead, Chris. Chris. <laughs> well, no, I, I I would agree. I don't the idea that um, you're going to use an entire philosophy to put everything in that is. I mean, I think that's a way of looking at something, perhaps. You know, uh, maybe a little beardsy in, in a way, um, yeah. But I, I would agree that I don't think you want to be married so much to one philosophy that that's how you're going to filter everything. So, but I do think there's a, I think there is a degree of of that in terms of, uh, you know, I, I think there's a degree of it to this very day. I mean, when's the last time we uh, executed a wealthy person? How often, how often does a wealthy person end up spending time in prison versus a person uh, without means? Um, so I think there is a degree of that. Yeah. I mean, there's just thousands of cases every day, though, where Joe Schmoes like you and I are in uh, are in court and seeking justice for, you know, my, my roof wasn't put on right. You know, I mean, that's uh, I mean, there's thousands of those cases every day. Right. Well, I think about yeah, and again. I wasn't trying to shoehorn. It was uh, more of a kind of a foundation to to provide a perspective there. And I would agree with you that uh, there's a myriad of, of of things going on here. But I and I still look at our justice system today. And and uh, you know one of the issues I don't know if it's going on in your territory, but in California is cashless bail. You know, and we look at the right you know the right of bail in in the Eighth Amendment. All right, and we know how that's played out. All right. If you're poor, all right, you have, and I don't know what what the numbers are, but you know, uh, twenty times more likelihood that you're going to spend a bulk of time in jail without being found guilty of any crime. 
all right, because of cash bail, all right, to me, which is a justice system that leans towards the, the benefit of, yeah. of a, a certain class of people, and that's the money class. Well, that was the uh, anti-federalist argument against the federal courts. They believe that they were be uh, that the advantaged, the privileged would be advantaged in the federal court systems, and they made a big argument about, you know, these courts will be so far removed from Joe Schmo, and you know he would have to uh, spend a lot of money to bring his witnesses and get there. So the anti-federalist chime in with a lot of those kind of critiques of the federal court system favoring the wealthy and uh, to the deprivation of, of uh, the rights of regular citizens. So, Chris, does the fact that the availability of land, and we're looking now again in the uh, 17th, 18th century, and the absence of a feudal tradition between uh, England and the colonies explain the different paths all right, towards the rule of law and representation? That's a fascinating question, David. Um, Gosh, I think though I would I'm going to push back just on a little bit of the context context of the question and the fact that I do believe we end up with a uh, a natural feudal feudal system in the South and the plantation system. I think we end up with that certainly in terms of land. And does that beget uh, uh, differences in terms of uh, rule of law and representation? Yeah, it does because you know I think through time immemorial money talks and bovine fecal matter walks. I mean, that's a, I think I, maybe that's a wisdom from the Lincoln tap. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, so it, I think it depends, honestly. Um, I think that you'll. Um, well, I, I mean, you, you kind I, of I think to further Chris's point, and by the way, I'm not sure bovine would be a word heard at the Lincoln Tap, but uh, I think well, I, I was trying to clean that up. Well, the other word would be heard at at uh, Lincoln Tap, but I think populists made this argument, did they not? That the West was a feudal uh, was a feudal environment run by big corporations, and they felt like they were you know feudal vassals. So I, I think the populist era and, you know, and eventually the progressive reforms attempting to address those kind of things, the populists would, would, would uh, I, I think, to Chris's point, they would make that argument that we have a feudal system and we're just calling it something else. And, well, and, they, and you see that in, in some of the things that they push for, right? You yeah. know, they're talking about the direct election of senators and deregulation of the railroad and the telegraph and some of the, the free coins of silver. You know, so you're seeing some of that out of that populist movement from the yeah. Plains states, Kansas, Nebraska, et cetera. But I'm going to try to I'm really trying to think of your question, David. I think it's a tough question for me to answer because I would say. Um, land has always meant power. And whoever controls the land is going to have that power. Well, yeah, that I sounds that, Marxist to me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> well, um, yeah, but, you know, we want to think that people should have equal treatment under the law. Right. I mean, again, I think I've said that before. That's the mission statement. Uh, the Supreme Court has this mission statement on the front of its building, equal justice under law. Um, we would like to think that, but, um, you know, <laughs> you, you're, you guys are all familiar with the golden rule. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. Um, I think there's a there's a lot of truth in that. So I'm not trying to be a, a Marxist, but I do think that throughout history, you can see the people that uh, people of color, uh, women, indigent people, um, uh, holy cow, um, gosh, uh, right to an attorney. Uh, that what's the help, help me out? Um, Gideon, Gideon, yeah, I mean, Gideon, there's an indigent guy in Florida, you know, who's, um, so pushing forward, I think it's taken things like that to get that equal treatment under the law in terms of representation. Well, I, I think, agree with you that, that 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 feudal, you know, again, we see that feudalism develop in the southern states. Maybe we see it in the West. But I, I'm wondering, at least in the early development, it, does 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 the American do the American colonies and states have a greater democratic impulse, small d democracy impulse because of the availability of land and the yeah, absence yes. of this rigid system oh, there oh, oh, you know, that, that we don't see in England. Is that? A, yeah, a there's an interesting study that was done about Boston in the early uh, late colonial or early republic. 
Boston, there's thousands of people coming into Boston, but Boston never, it, it, it never gets above 10,000. Where are all those people going? They are going, you know, they're floating west and uh, land. And I think Jefferson's original vision about like uh, was anti-feudal in a way that the West uh, America would be this place of of uh, sturdy yeoman farmers decentralized, you know, uh, throughout the West. So I think that's kind of an anti-feudalism in Jeffersonian vision. You know, maybe maybe the uh, Republicans passed the Homestead Act in eighteen sixty four ish. Uh, kind of on the same notion that, you know, you know, everybody's, uh, you know, everybody has their piece of turf. So I, I think there is an anti-feudal ethos from the very beginning uh, to to your question directly, David. And, and yeah, David, I would agree for sure the, the way you just explained that in terms of the availability of the land. Well, of course, we are, we know that there are people that are living on the land. I don't want to negate the fact that right, the native right. populations would be driven off of that land. Um, I mean, that's, I think it goes without saying, but it shouldn't go without saying we may, we should include that when we talk about this, but the availability of that land is a magnet for people, a great magnet, because again, uh, when, uh, I think to use a term that Turner uses, uh, in his turn in his thesis that when things crystallize in the East, right. And so, you know, I ask students, what's it mean to crystallize it no longer is fluid. It moves from a liquid to a solid. And when there's no fluidity in the ability for people to move up, that availability of land to the West is a great magnet because now you, it is a great democratizing agent because now you have risen, you, you have risen up as a person with that land, you now have political power, uh, you have economic power, you have social power. So I think for sure that the availability of land does increase that democratic spirit. And we see that in the, in the colonial era. You see it, in, you know, Washington complains about some of his men in the Continental Army and too much democracy kind of thing, all the way to the uh, Shays Rebellion. I Mike can't but think the Northwest Ordinance is also a part of that uh, anti-feudal ethos of land ownership and land organization in the West. It facilitates. Yeah, no, I was going to bring up the point about that property was associated with getting political rights. So having property available is important. Um, also, I mean, the way I teach feudalism is that um, the the kings and queens up top would literally like give other elites land and say, do what you want there as long as you get taxes back to me, right? It was super decentralized. And I think we could look at the political development of the West as probably at the very beginning stages looking more feudal but as there's an interest in securing national authority, both for the commercial interests as well as for the property inter interests of people there, and then you know, so-called protecting people against the indigenous communities that were there, I think you quickly see that turn in where it's not the same. You're not going to have the same kind of feudal arrangements. Um, the national government is going to want to have much more of a say. So I think. To the part of your question about the rule of law, I think that kind of goes with, with that. So help me out, Professor Williams. Um, earlier in the program, I think uh, Chris or somebody mentioned this 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 concept of salutary neglect. Uh, there back in the 1100s, quite possibly. And so this question seems to lean heavily on this notion of the the tremendous influence of British political thought on the development. And, and structure of American constitutional government. Yet, I've also learned that we've got this, this period of salutary neglect in which, in some ways, there's this organic development of our particular American, all right, view of law and justice and representation. Can you help clarify between those two things? Because like I said, it, which one is it? Is yeah. it we are the birth child of the English system or we are an organic creation of our own because we were left alone for so long? Well, I mean, you're not going to like the answer because it's a little bit of both. I mean, of I, course. I, I think um, and it's, <laughs> that's always the answer. And it's a lot Marxist. So let me get to that part. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, th this it wasn't an intended policy outcome of the British to like 
um, not enforce these laws and to allow for more autonomy, for allow for a more sense of independence. I mean, that's that's the consequence of this period, right? But I think if you ask yourself uh, what what stories, what lessons, what narratives do folks have in their heads, it, it's coming from that British foundation for, for many of them. This is where it gets really, I think, interesting as we think about the country changing with migration and we're going to get people coming from, you know, Germany and from Italy. We have, my goodness, the the the, the political imaginations of the Africans who were brought here as, as slaves and those of indigenous communities, they kind of get, um, well, they get overcome by this, by the, by the power centers that be that the seeds are there from the British, the stories about the Magna Carta, the stories about um, these legal principles. But then in the cultural context where these seeds are being planted, it's going to take on its own sort of flavor. And I think that, I think that happens in all places. Um, I mean, d- just as a quick comparison, this is so similar to uh, South Africa's political history, when um, you know the the Dutch, the Dutch um, um, kind of uh, established a colony in 1650s. Um, the, there's a whole bunch of different people there living in different ways with their Dutch uh, uh, law and everything. And the British kind of show up in in 1800s and be like, okay, you're under British rule now. We just beat Napoleon. Um, follow all, follow what we say. And um, they set up common law. They set up a lot of the things of the British experience. But to this day in South Africa, there are those of Dutch descent who would say, no, we just we live in one single nation state now with a single constitution, right? But our our political and legal imaginations are just much different. So I think this is something that you could trace back in most societies and see this kind of cognitive dissonance of some things being the same, but some things being really uh, different. I th- I think the uh, the American evolution from British uh, the rights of British uh, to natural rights is is a part of that configuration uh, evolution. I also think the 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 colonial's insistence on rights of trials of, by jury of peers uh in you know in vicinage that's a deeply rooted british tradition that uh colonials hang on to um i mean the taxation uh by people that we choose that's way back to magna carta and that certainly is is a, a key slogan within the american revolutionary context uh, so I think they they inherit these ideas and then they, uh, to Mike's point, they, they may tweak them a little bit uh, for convenience. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the political imagination is is a process. I really, yeah, I think Mike's point's well taken on that. We are a hybrid. All right. If, if, if there's a singular way we want to identify America, Americans and America in the 18th century is we are a hybrid. Is that accurate? Well, it, yeah, and it also means we're not that special, and that's that's where a lot of folks, I think, really kind of jump would would jump ship. I think we are a hybrid of a lot of things, but for some reason, we want to hold on to that narrative of, of American exceptionalism, uh, which you know, um, I I think it it you know if you look at it, and and after about a half hour of reading, you come to the conclusion that we are a hybrid, and maybe we ought not to be tooting our horn as being all that in a bag of chips. And he, David, you know what's funny is that in a previous broadcast uh, show we talked about the Second Amendment, you brought up the 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 English case, right? And about how the justices are comporting yeah. themselves to link us back to that period. But then, you know, as Gladwell and you pointed out, they completely got the case wrong. It's been misinterpreted, <laughs> right? So it, it makes us do all these kind of funny things to to get to this idea of being exceptional. Or yep. to be super linked to a a past that's a lot more complicated. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the special. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Well, we've come no, to the end, uh, gentlemen. Surprisingly, we've come to the end of <laughs> of talking about the British influence here. And so, as we always do, uh, we'd like to wrap up with some insights, recommendations by our scholars to students and teachers as they prepare for their presentations. Professor Cavanaugh. 
Um, I'm going to include in the resources a, a law review article that I've been working my way through, and it's called General Law and the 14th Amendment. It's by some pretty pretty uh, good scholars. Um, and uh, it's really interesting because they don't call it common law. They call it general law. And describing even in colonial periods, the general law that existed and was carried out, and as Tim kind of was alluding to, in a very local fashion. And they they bring that all the way through to the 14th Amendment and this concept. So uh, I'm not finished the article yet, but I think the students may find it fascinating, especially in this discussion of, of common law and our British heritage uh, and, and tracing that back. Um, this is uh, obviously it's a unit one question, but it is such a history laden question that it could be a, a hybrid, if you will, and be in unit two. Um, so, uh, students know your history and the good news is unless you have like uh, a judge, uh, Tim Moore, or maybe a professor of, uh, English history, um, you're going to know way more than your judges. So that's what you're, you're going to be okay. Professor Moore. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, this is, a uh, yeah, this kind of common law stuff is really, uh, don't get discouraged would be is what I would say to students, because there is so much uh, debate about the origins and the significant events within the common law narratives. So don't get discouraged. Uh, know those things. But if you want a, a nice, clean answer to this common law evolution, I, I would recommend you just kind of relax that there's differing variations on the origin and the key events, and that's okay. Professor Williams. I just think we should make clear whoever's hung on this long that Marx was not English. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but but my 18th century history professor wa uh, was. Uh, no, I'm just, no, that wasn't a comment on you. I just want to make sure we really, he really got brought up a lot today. It was good. Um, <laughs> Okay, my, my my advice is a little it's a little off. I, I think it's um I think it's inter interesting to think about the the other way to think about like what things from the British um political symbols have did our were the framers, founders, Americans attached to and still attached to? Like I'm it's very curious to me, like um just the, the the way we treat our presidents is very much as the English treated their monarch. Um, and um, the, the sort of the symbols around that and, and everything. So I think that's another way to think about this hybrid, uh, uh, this hybrid nature of, of our political culture, um, because there's a lot of those things that are deeply ingrained in our political system as well. My only recommendation is maybe maybe you hope that one of the judges will ask you about the genesis of common law and you can kill your entire hearing time just talking <laughs> about that and you're done. Uh, so think about that, students and teachers. Uh, in our next session, we're going to be uh, hopefully talking to some uh, unit four people about the take care clause and the uh, executive branch uh, there uh, and its general expansion uh, through history. Until then. Peace, love, yogurt tacos. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.